Chapter Four of Agnes Grey by Anne Bronte. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. The Grandmamma. I spare my readers the account of my delight on coming home, enjoying a brief space of rest and liberty in that dear familiar place among the loving and the loved, and my sorrow on being obliged to bid them once more a long adieu. I returned, however, with unabated vigour to my work, a more arduous task than any one can imagine who has not felt something like the misery of being charged with the care and direction of a set of mischievous turbulent rebels, whom his utmost exertions cannot bind to their duty, while at the same time he is responsible for their conduct to a higher power, who exacts from him what cannot be achieved without the aid of the superior's more potent authority, which either from indolence or the fear of becoming unpopular with the said rebellious gang, the latter refuses to give. I can conceive of few situations more harassing than that wherein, however you may long for success, however you may labour to fulfil your duty, your efforts are baffled and set at naught by those beneath you, and unjustly censured and misjudged by those above. I have not enumerated half the vexatious propensities of my pupils, or half the troubles resulting from my heavy responsibilities, for fear of trespassing too much upon the reader's patience, as perhaps I have already done. But my design in writing the last few pages was not to amuse, but to benefit those whom it might concern. He that has no interest in such matters will doubtless have skipped them over with a cursory glance and perhaps a malediction against the prolixity of the writer. But if a parent has therefrom gained any useful hint, or an unfortunate governess received thereby the slightest benefit, I am well rewarded for my pains. Sometimes on such occasions the thought has suddenly occurred to me, if they could see me now, meaning, of course, my friends at home, and the idea of how they would pity me has made me pity myself, so greatly that I have had the utmost difficulty to restrain my tears. But I have restrained them, till my little tormentors were gone to desert, or cleared off to bed, my only prospects of deliverance. And then, in all the bliss of solitude, I have given myself up to the luxury of an unrestricted burst of weeping. But this was a weakness I did not often indulge. My employments were too numerous, my leisure moments too precious to admit of much time being given to fruitless lamentations. I particularly remember one wild, snowy afternoon, soon after my return in January. The children had all come up from dinner, loudly declaring that they meant to be naughty, and they had well kept their resolution, though I had talked myself hoarse and wearied every muscle in my throat in vain attempt to reason them out of it. I had got Tom pinned up in a corner, whence I told him he should not escape till he had done his appointed task. Meanwhile Fanny had possessed herself of my work-bag, and was rifling its contents and spitting into it besides. I told her to let it alone, but to no purpose, of course. "'Burn it, Fanny!' cried Tom, and this command she hastened to obey. I sprang to snatch it from the fire, and Tom darted to the door. "'Marianne, throw her desk out of the window!' cried he, and my precious desk, containing my letters and papers, my small amount of cash and all my valuables, was about to be precipitated from the three-story window. I flew to rescue it. Meanwhile Tom had left the room, and was rushing down the stairs, followed by Fanny. Having secured my desk, I ran to catch them, and Marianne came scampering after. All three escaped me, and ran out of the house into the garden, where they plunged about in the snow, shouting and screaming in exultant glee. What must I do? If I followed them, I should probably be unable to capture one, and only drive them further away. If I did not, how was I to get them in? And what would their parents think of me if they saw or heard their children rioting, hatless, bonnetless, gloveless, and bootless, in the deep, soft snow? While well, I stood in this perplexity, just without the door, trying by grim looks and angry words to awe them into subjection, 
I heard a voice behind me, in harshly piercing tones, exclaiming, "'Miss Gray, is it possible? What in the devil's name can you be thinking about?' "'I cannot get them in, sir,' I said, turning round, and beholding Mr. Bloomfield, with his hair on end, and his pale blue eyes bolting from their sockets. "'But I insist upon their being got in,' cried he, approaching near her, and looking perfectly ferocious. "'Then, sir, you must call them yourself, if you please, for they won't listen to me,' I replied, stepping back. "'Come in with you, you filthy brats, or I'll horsewhip you, every one,' roared he, and the children instantly obeyed. "'There, you see, they come at the first word. "'Yes, when you speak. "'And it's very strange that when you've the care of them, you've no better control over them than that. "'Now, there they are, gone upstairs with their nasty snowy feet. "'Do go after em and see them made decent, for heaven's sake.' "'That gentleman's mother was then staying in the house, "'and as I ascended the stairs and passed the drawing-room door, "'I had the satisfaction of hearing the old lady declaiming aloud to her daughter-in-law to this effect, "'for I could only distinguish the more emphatic words. "'Gracious heavens! Never in all my life! to get their death as sure as do you think my dear she is a proper person take my word for it i heard no more but that sufficed the senior mrs bloomfield had been very attentive and civil to me until now i had thought her a nice kind-hearted chatty old body she would often come to me and talk in a confidential strain nodding and shaking her head and gesticulating with hands and eyes as a certain class of old ladies are wont to do, though I never knew one that carried the peculiarity to so great an extent. She would even sympathize with me for the trouble I had with the children, and express at times, by half-sentences, interspersed with nods and knowing winks, her sense of the injudicious conduct of their mamma in so restricting my power, and neglecting to support me with her authority such mode of testifying disapprobation was not much to my taste and i generally refused to take it in or understand anything more than was openly spoken at least i never went farther than an implied acknowledgment that if matters were otherwise ordered my task would be a less difficult one and i should be better able to guide and instruct my charge but now i must be doubly cautious hitherto though i saw the old lady had her defects one of which was a proneness to proclaim her perfections i had always been wishful to excuse them and to give her credit for all the virtues she professed and even imagine others yet untold kindness which had been the food of my life through so many years had lately been so entirely denied to me that i welcomed with grateful joy the slightest semblance of it no wonder then that my heart warmed to the old lady and was always gladdened at her approach and regretted her departure but now the few words luckily or unluckily heard in passing had wholly revolutionized my ideas respecting her now i looked upon her as hypocritical and insincere a flatterer and a spy upon my words and deeds Doubtless it would have been my interest still to meet her with the same cheerful smile and tone of respectable cordiality as before, but I could not, if I would. My manner altered with my feelings, and became so cold and shy that she could not fail to notice it. She soon did notice it, and her manner altered too. The familiar nod was changed to a stiff bow. The gracious smile gave place to a glare of gorgon ferocity. Her vivacious loquacity was entirely transferred from me to the darling boy and girls, whom she flattered and indulged more absurdly than ever their mother had done. I confess I was somewhat troubled at this change. I feared the consequences of her displeasure, and even made some efforts to recover the ground I had lost, and with better apparent success than I could have anticipated. At one time I, merely in common civility, asked after her cough, and immediately her long visage relaxed into a smile, and she favoured me with a particular history of that and her other infirmities, followed by an account of her pious resignation, delivered in the usual emphatic declamatory style which no writing can portray. 
but there's one remedy for all my dear and that's resignation a toss of the head resignation to the will of heaven an uplifting of the hands and eyes it has always supported me through all my trials and always will do a succession of nods but then it isn't everybody that can say that a shake of the head but i'm one of the pious ones miss gray a very significant nod and toss and thank heaven i always was another nod and i glory in it an emphatic clasping of the hands and shaking of the head and with several texts of scripture misquoted or misapplied and religious exclamations so redolent of the ludicrous in the style of delivery and manner of bringing in if not in the expressions themselves that i decline repeating them she withdrew tossing her large head in high good humour with herself at least and left me hoping that after all she was rather weak than wicked at her next visit to wellwood house i went so far as to say that i was glad to see her looking so well the effect of this was magical the words intended as a mark of civility were received as a flattering compliment her countenance brightened up and from that moment she became as gracious and benign as heart could wish in outward semblance at least from what i now saw of her and what i heard from the children i know that in order to gain her cordial friendship i had but to utter a word of flattery at each convenient opportunity but this was against my principles and for lack of this the capricious old dame soon deprived me of her favour again and i believe did me much secret injury she could not greatly influence her daughter-in-law against me because between that lady and herself there was a mutual dislike chiefly shown by her in secret detractions and calumniations by the other in an excess of frigid formality in her demeanour and no fawning flattery of the elder could thaw away the wall of ice which the younger interposed between them but with her son the old lady had better success he would listen to all she had to say provided she could soothe his fretful temper and refrain from irritating him by her own asperities and i have reason to believe that she considerably strengthened his prejudice against me she would tell him that i shamefully neglected the children and even his wife did not attend to them as she ought and that he must look after them himself or they would all go to ruin thus urged he would frequently give himself the trouble of watching them from the windows during their play at times he would follow them through the grounds and too often came suddenly upon them while they were dabbling in the forbidden well talking to the coachman in the stables or revelling in the filth of the farmyard and i meanwhile wearily standing by having previously exhausted my energy in vain attempts to get them away often too he would unexpectedly pop his head into the schoolroom while the young people were at meals and find them spilling their milk over the table and themselves plunging their fingers into their own or each other's mugs and quarrelling over their victuals like a set of tiger's cubs if i were quiet at the moment i was conniving at their disorderly conduct if as was frequently the case i happened to be exalting my voice to enforce order i was using undue violence and setting the girls a bad example by such ungentleness of tone and language i remember one afternoon in spring when owing to the rain they could not go out but by some amazing good fortune they had all finished their lessons and yet abstained from running down to tease their parents a trick that annoyed me greatly but on rainy days i could seldom prevent their doing because below they found novelty and amusement especially when visitors were in the house and their mother though she bid me keep them in the schoolroom would never chide them for leaving it or trouble herself to send them back but this day they appeared satisfied with their present abode and what is more wonderful still seemed disposed to play together without depending on me for amusement and without quarrelling with each other this occupation was a somewhat puzzling one they were all squatted together on the floor by the window over a heap of broken toys and a quantity of birds eggs or rather egg shells for the contents had luckily been abstracted these shells they had broken up and were pounding into small fragments 
to what end I could not imagine. But so long as they were quiet and not in positive mischief, I did not care, and with a feeling of unusual repose I sat by the fire, putting the finishing stitches on a frock for Marianne's doll, intending, when that was done, to begin a letter to my mother. Suddenly the door opened, and the dingy head of Mr. Bloomfield looked in. "'All very quiet in here. What are you doing?' said he. "'No harm to-day, at least,' thought I. But he was of a different opinion. Advancing to the window, and seeing the children's occupations, he testily exclaimed, "'What in the world are you about?' "'We're grinding up eggshells, papa,' cried Tom. "'How dare you make such a mess, you little devils! Don't you see what confounded work you're making of the carpet?' The carpet was a plain brown drugget. "'Miss Gray, did you know what they were doing?' "'Yes, sir.' "'You knew it?' "'Yes.' "'You knew it, and you actually sat there and permitted them to go on without a word of reproof?' "'I didn't think they were doing any harm.' "'Any harm? Why, look there, just look at the carpet and see. Was there ever anything like it in a Christian house before? No wonder your room is not fit for a pig's die. No wonder your pupils are worse than a litter of pigs. No wonder. Oh, I declare, it puts me quite past my patience. And he departed, shutting the door after him with a bang that made the children laugh. It puts me quite past my patience, too, muttered I, getting up, and seizing the poker. I dashed it repeatedly into the cinders, and stirred them up with unwanted energy, thus easing my irritation, under pretense of mending the fire. After this, Mr. Bloomfield was continually looking in to see if the schoolroom was in order, and as the children were continually littering the floor with fragments of toys, sticks, stones, stubble, leaves, and other rubbish, which I could not prevent their bringing, or oblige them to gather up, and which the servants refused to clean after them, I had to spend a considerable portion of my valuable leisure moments on my knees upon the floor, in painfully reducing things to order. Once I told them that they should not taste their supper till they had picked up everything from the carpet. Fanny might have hers when she had taken up a certain quantity, Mary Ann when she had gathered twice as many, and Tom was to clear away the rest. Wonderful to state, the girls did their part. But Tom was in such a fury that he flew upon the table, scattered the bread and milk upon the floor, struck his sisters, kicked the coals out of the coal-pan, and seemed inclined to make a Douglas larder of the whole contents of the room. But I seized upon him, and sending Marianne to call her mamma, held him, in spite of kicks, blows, yells, and execrations, till Mrs. Bloomfield made her appearance. "'What is the matter with my boy?' said she. And when the matter was explained to her, all she did was to send for the nursery-maid to put the room in order, and bring Master Bloomfield his supper. "'There now!' cried Tom triumphantly, looking up from his viands with his mouth almost too full for speech. "'There now, Miss Gray. You see, I've got my supper in spite of you, and I haven't picked up a single thing.' The only person in the house who had any real sympathy for me was the nurse, for she had suffered like afflictions, though in a smaller degree, as she had not the task of teaching, nor was she so responsible for the conduct of her charge. "'Oh, Miss Gray,' she would say. "'You have some trouble with them, childer. I have indeed, Betty, and I dare say you know what it is. Ay, I do so. But I don't vex myself over em as you do. And then, you see, I hit em a slap sometimes. And then, little ones, I give em a good whipping now and then. There's nothing else will do for em, as what they say. Howsoever, I've lost my place for it. Have you, Betty? I heard you were going to leave.' Ah, bless you, yes. Missus gave me a warning a three weeks in. She told me afore Christmas how it might be if I hit him again, but I couldn't hold my hand off him at nothing. I know not how you do, for Miss Marianne's worse by the half nor her sisters. End of chapter four.